Welcome to the MS Perspective podcast, Perspective with a K, as I'm German. I'm Nele Hanswerke, MS patient, patient advocate and author. I'm bringing you interviews, inspiration and information about living with multiple sclerosis and show you ways how you can positively influence the disease and make the best out of your diagnosis. On ms-perspective.com, you will find the show notes, 11 free tips as a PDF, and lots of other information. And now the show begins. This podcast is supported by MidMission, a project of the nonprofit Herdy Foundation. Hello and welcome to episode number 31, Actrims 2023, Day 2. Menopause, Treatment Efficacy, Immune Reconstitution Therapy, Healthy Lifestyle. The second day at MS Milan 2023 was again packed with lots of valuable information. And so many exciting presentations happened at the same time. I will focus on the following topics. Number one, burning debate about menopause. All women with MS should start hormone replacement therapy. Number two, treatment efficacy. Number three, Satellite Symposium 5, how immune reconstitution therapy has transformed MS management. Scientific session number 13, healthy lifestyle for MS management. And finally, scientific session number 14, pulmonary gut brain access. Just a remark at the beginning. I used the provided content during the Actrums 2023 presentations to a large extent and just added some explanations to make it more easy to understand. So let's start with a burning debate about menopause. All women with MS should start hormone replacement therapy. This presentation was done in a pro and contra style, but not really comparable. Rhonda Voskel, being on pro-hormone replacement, explains the importance of creating a different style of trials that focus on main cognitive issues that come with menopause and do them with a safer type of hormone replacement. Melinda Maggiari is contra-hormone replacement and argues with lots of old data where the risky hormone replacement was used and that was not looking into the specific issues but more on a broader generic view. So I will concentrate on the presentation of Rhonda Woskul as her data and arguments were scientifically and statistically more reasonable from my point of view. Pro-hormone replacement and menopause. Rhonda Voskul is professor at the Department of Neurology at the David Gavin School of Medicine at UCLA and holds the Jack H. Skirball Chair in MS Research and is a director of the UCLA Multiple Sclerosis Program. She just won the Rachel Horn Prize for Women's Research in MS for her pioneering work that focuses on understanding the sexual differences in susceptibility and progression of MS, and she has been instrumental in identifying potential therapies to enhance outcomes for MS patients. So what is the background? Sex hormones are neuroprotective, estrogen and testosterone. So when they are ending, they influence the progression of multiple sclerosis. For men, this starts around 30 and is a slow dropping until 75. For women, this happens in a very short amount of time. Around the age of 50, the estrogen level drops abrupt to zero within five years, or more or less zero. There has been used questionnaires for women which resulted all in a significant worsening of symptoms beginning of menopause but not much was done so far. Within the last five to ten years, objective exams were done with the same findings. Existing symptoms and neurodegeneration were worsening. A MRI study showed the connection of ovarian failure and disability worsening as well as an increased cortical atrophy. Menopause in healthy women. Let's do a look there. Neuropsychologists found clear proof for brain fog <clears throat> related to menopause, especially a drop in verbal memory and processing speed. Very specific domains are affected, not IQ or general intelligence. When women have surgical menopause early on and brain MRIs are done, they have a higher hippocampal cortex atrophy. So clear outcome, menopause is bad subjectively, objectively, by MRI. Important for trial design is 
that the atrophy is region-specific on hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. How to treat the abrupt in estrogen with menopause. Proper trial design should focus on the following primary outcomes. Number one, for cognition, domain-specific, so including processing speed and verbal memory. Number two, for brain atrophy, region-specific, so hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Estrogen timing is also important. It needs to be treated before 65 years, within 5 to 10 years. The estrogen type is important. Estriol is in favor, not the other options, as they are not effective or dangerous due to possible severe side effects. Estrogen dose, higher is better, so estriol is in favor as it can be given in high doses. There was a recent paper in Nature Communications, which I have linked in the um, blog entry. So hormone replacement with estriol and MS models showed remyelination and axonal sparing in the spinal cord and corpus callosum. Furthermore, it reduced the atrophy and synaptic loss in the cerebral cortex and hippocampus and improved remyelination in the cerebral cortex and hippocampus. There was a phase two trial so a small group of women with MS before menopause who received 12 months estriol compared to placebo, and the actual treated women had an improvement in processing speed, a reduced cerebral cortex atrophy, and reduced serum neurofilament light chains. The abbreviation is SNFL, and they show if there is neurodegeneration happening in the brain. And you can check it via serum, which means you can check it by blood. Higher dose caused higher blood levels and which related to higher improvements. Dose matter. What is the next step? A multicenter phase two double blind cooperator controlled trial in the United States at seven sites. It will be estriol treatment with tailored progesterone to menopausal women with MS in the age of 45 to 65. The primary outcome will be MRI checking the cerebral cortex atrophy. The secondary outcome will be cognitive, uh, so domain-specific, and the zero neurofilament light chains, the SNFLs. The exploratory outcome will be other MRIs, such as hippocampus and thalamus, and other MRS disabilities. And a final remark, please discuss with your MS neurologist and gynecologist if hormone replacement therapy is an option for you. So let's come to the next topic, treatment efficacy starting with sequencing and escalation. The escalation strategy has changed. So for a long time, people used to start with low effective therapy and only were escalated to higher therapies when the therapy was not working. Nowadays, more and more clinicians and countries start with level two or even level three of effectiveness. When registry data compared the groups starting with a higher efficacy earlier, the risk of progression is lower. But it is not easy to compare because the patients who never had to go on high efficacy therapies are not included in the data. Clear message here, when there is indication for an active or even highly active MS, it is better to start early on high efficacy treatments as they are clearly outperforming the slowly escalating therapy strategy when it comes to long-term progression. If all indicators show a very mild cause of MS, it is still okay to start with a low efficacy treatment. Sequencing of DMTs, so disease-modifying treatments. Autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or AHSCT for short, outperforms natalizumab in a highly active relapsing MS on reduction of relapses and confirmed disability improvement. But there is no significant difference between a AHSCT versus natalizumab in a progressive MS. So the clinical disease phenotype is very helpful to predict the response to escalation of immunotherapy. Sequencing of DMTs. Keeping the washout period as short as possible is smart and has a positive impact on the long-term progression. So starting fast with another treatment keeps the MS better under control. Triggers of treatment escalation. There are four indicators that suggest to start a high efficacy treatment. Number one, relapses. Number two, increase in EDSS, the expanded disability status scale. Number three, new, enhancing or enlarging brain lesions. 
Number four, higher neurofilament light chains in the serum. Conclusion, early use of high efficacy therapies for people with indication of an active to very aggressive disease results in clearly better control of the disease and improved disability outcome than does their delayed use. This is true for RRMS, so relapsing remitting MS. Treatment is still a big challenge for people with progressive MS. Don't wait long when the therapy of level 1 or level 2 is not being effective to suppress multiple sclerosis sufficiently. Be proactive and change to a higher efficacy level. We start to get a better understanding of latent disease, worsening and its pathogenesis, and this will allow for more precise choices of high efficacy therapies early in the disease course. Let's talk about evaluating age-dependent efficacy of multiple sclerosis treatments in a real-life cohort by Matteo Betti. Efficacy of DMTs on disability progression is significantly reduced in people with MS over 40 to 45 years. A meta-analysis from 2017 of 38 randomized controlled trials, for short RCTs, in people with MS showed that beyond the age of 40 and a half year, there is no greater efficacy of high effective treatment than platform therapies, so level one in terms of disability accrual prevention. A real-world observational study comparing infusible DMTs like natalizumab and rituximab versus oral DMTs like thimerosal fumarate and fingolimod in 1,246 people with MS did not find differences in terms of disease activity reduction beyond the age of 45. Another meta-analysis from 2022 of RCTs of depleting agents like cladribine, anti-CD20 and alemtuzumab showed a greater risk of developing neoplasms after the age of 45 years. Methods. The Italian MS registry was used with a defined minimum baseline data set. All patients were either cis, so diagnosed with a clinical isolated syndrome, or RR, so relapsing remitting course, at the first evaluation and followed up minimum two years. The outcome was defined as a 24-week confirmed disability accumulation, abbreviation as CDA, and the expanded disability status scale, the EDSS. Patients were matched so that they were comparable on sex, age, disease duration, and severity of the disease and more. At the end, out of 82,197 registered patients, 5,259 patients could be matched. 3,477 of them starting a platform DMT, disease-modifying treatment, and 1,782 starting a high-efficacy DMT. Conclusion. Age subgroup below 45 years had a clear benefit of starting high efficacy treatments, but the age subgroup of patients older than 45 years had on a group level no advantage of high efficacy treatments when compared to platform DMTs. So when taking the long-term course into account, there was a clear benefit of high efficacy treatments started earlier in life, and even any DMT started earlier in life compared to no DMT or shorter DMT usage before the age of 45. However, at the individual level, early high-efficacy treatment could be still more effective, reliable biomarkers identifying the subgroup of patients are needed. Let's move on to the satellite symposium number 5, how immune reconstitution therapy has transformed MS management. And I start with the um, presentation of Dr. Ge Gavin Giovannoni, Why Time Matters in MS. Smoldering MS or neurodegeneration is there from the very beginning of the MS disease course and can begin before MS is detected clinically. Losses in productivity have been reported in patients with early MS in a real-world prospective cohort study from Canada. In that study, with 512 all participants showed no or mild disability at baseline, EDSS score below 3.5, except for 15 with a higher EDSS score. However, the time and cost burden of MS was evident over three months. 55% reported a loss in work productivity that caused work time lost and therefore real money. The performance indicators have been associated with unemployment and loss of productivity 
including impaired visual acuity, impaired cognitive processing, and impaired manual dexterity. Preventing disability accumulation is the main argument for treating early. In the Clarity and Clarity Extension trials, it made a difference if people started right away with cladribine tablets or two years later. Brain health can be preserved that way and brain atrophy limited. Immune reconstitution treatment in MS, what we've learned by G1O. Optimizing treatment sequencing is important when considering disease duration and involving patient needs. Most patients will require more than one DMT throughout their disease course, taking into account that a patient spends on average over 40 years living with a mass. Therefore, treatment should be selected to address the immediate clinical problem and keep subsequent therapeutic options open. And please remember, early treatment with a high efficacy DMT is important in reducing the risk of neuronal injury, which comes with the cost of increasing disability. MS treatment approach impacts the immune system in different ways. Number one, chronic immune depleting therapies are given regularly and the clinical efficacy stays during the active dosing more or less, maybe a bit longer. Number two, when using immune reconstitution therapy, the drug is administered very seldom and with big time intervals in between while providing a long-term clinical efficacy that extends beyond the active dosing. Studying patients on DMTs that cause continuous iron depletion may increase the risk of some adverse events developing over time, but doesn't have to. The risk of serious infection is increased with continuous iron depletion and is higher than in the general population. When using iron reconstitution therapy, there is a reduction phase at the beginning, followed by a repopulation and later on reconstitution phase. But the mixture of imion cells that come back are different from before. They are in a better imion balance, so fewer imion cells that want to destroy healthy tissue in the central nervous system. Based on MRI activity already in months two of administration, cladribine tablets, so when the cycle of the first year is finished, there is clear reduction of imion cells that may contribute to early onset of action and the repopulation of immune cells may reduce the risk of adverse events over time. Of the patients who experience adverse events, 53% report them within 45 days following the initiation of cladribine tablets. The most frequent treatment-related adverse events happen to be headache with 2.2%, gastrointestinal disorders with 2%, skin and subcutaneous tissue disorders with 1.8%, Lymphophenia, which is having an abnormality low level of lymphocytes in the blood, was 1.2%. Medication error was 1.2%. Fatigue was 0.8%. The low frequency of adverse events occurring after 45 days may allow more flexibility for lifelong MS care. The reconstitution of immune cells may result in sustained efficacy even so, the tablets are just taken in months 1 and months 2 of year 1 and year 2, but not in year 3 or year 4 while still providing benefits. Conclusion. Immune reconstitution therapies, or for short IRTs, may be beneficial when used early in the disease course to delay the progression of disease in the absence of continuous immune suppression and reducing inflammation in the most inflammatory phase of the disease. But they are not suitable for everyone and detailed consultation by a neurologist, preferably specialized on MS, is needed. Summary how immune reconstitution therapy has transformed MS management. Early treatment with cladribine tablets was associated with better clinical outcomes. Cladribine tablets selectively target pathological disease-triggering memory B-cells while maintaining protective immune function. Real-world data supports the long-term management of patients on cladribine tablets, including continued treatment in year 5 and beyond. Cognitive function and employment remained stable and health-related quality of life increased during treatment with cladribine tablets. One last remark on the topic. The session was sponsored by Merck, who are producing cladribine tablets, so it was extremely focusing on research regarding cladribine. 
Please keep in mind that therapy choices need to be made on your individual disease course and personal preferences, and there are lots of options out there. So let's come to the next session, scientific session number 13, Healthy Lifestyle for MS Management. Diet and Vitamin D by Ilana Katz-Sand. The immunomodulatory effects of vitamin D are relevant to MS and include impacts on the following types of immune cells. Monocytes and macrophages, dendritic cells, memory T cells, and B cells. There are neuroprotective effects of vitamin D, and there has been a lot of research done with clear evidence that a low vitamin D level increases the risk of getting MS. So low vitamin D levels during pregnancy increases the risk of MS for the babies to be born. There was more research done on the association between vitamin D levels and MS severity, disease activity, and progression. But interventional vitamin D supplementation trials have failed to meet the primary endpoints. Just a side note from me. The ultra-high-dose approach with the Coimbra protocol is not part of it, as Dr. Coimbra has never used a scientific-based study to prove his concept. He is convinced that his approach works and trains doctors for money, but does not provide scientific data. This is scientifically questionable. Observational studies i.e. real-world data, would be an opportunity to show whether the approach has potential without great financial expense. There is at least one such observational study underway at the Charité in Berlin, Germany, which was initiated by patients themselves. Results are expected in 2024 at the earliest. Please don't try to do ultra-high dose on your own without a good clinician and expert on your side, as this can cause severe damage to your health. Potential mechanisms for dietary effects include indirect effects mediated by comorbidities associated with worse outcomes, e.g. obesity, cholesterol levels, other vascular risk factors, and effects directly related to diet, e.g. on the dietary metabolism mediated through gut microbiota. There has been a study that showed an inverse association between Mediterranean diet and the risk of multiple sclerosis. Dietary components in MS. Grains and gluten, diary, meat, salt, fruits and vegetables. There are many popular dietary patterns out there and under investigation. For sure is a balanced diet like the Mediterranean style a good choice and has proven the following benefits. Better general health positive effect on cognitive aging, reasonable to aim for long-term adherence as it is a lifestyle change rather than a diet, budget-friendly and household involvement. Practical recommendations. Prepare meals at home as much as possible. Incorporate colorful fresh fruits and vegetables daily. If you choose to eat grains, choose whole grains over refined grains. Avoid or at least limit processed foods and added sugars as much as possible. So let's come to the next topic. Physical activity by Professor Dr. Ulrich Dalgas. The human genome is made to move, but we don't do that much anymore. That has an effect on the health for everybody and for MS patients even more. MS patients move less and is related to early deficits. The physical inactivity and deconditioning directly interacts with the disease process and progression, and both factors contribute to a worsening of symptoms. But the physical activity can be modified to a certain amount. To start with the definitions first, physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. Exercise is a subset of physical activity that is planned, structured, and repetitive and has a final or an intermediate objective, the improvement of maintenance of physical fitness. There has been proven evidence that exercise therapy can improve aerobic capacity, muscle strength, balance, cognition and walking capacity, as well as reducing pain, fatigue, and depressive symptoms. But please choose exercises that are beneficial for the brain, so no hits on the head as happens during boxing, American football or soccer when doing a header. Most other activities are fine and it's probably more important that you enjoy the sport and doing it with great pleasure on a regular basis. Summary. The physical activity level of persons with MS is still markedly lower than the general population. 
adhering to the physical activity recommendations is important already at early disease stages. Exercise is a safe and beneficial symptomatic treatment in MS. Numerous challenges still lies ahead of us. If you want to know more about the importance and positive effect of exercise, please check out my interview with Professor Ulrich Dalgas. It was number 22, Exploring Exercises, Immune Benefits and MS Symptom Relief, with Professor Ulrich Dalgas, Sharing Insights. Last but not least, scientific session number 14, Pulmonary Gut-Brain Access. Pulmonary Microbioma and CNS Autoimmunity by Francesca Uduardi. The central nervous system's autoimmunity is classically seen as a matter between the brain and the immune system, but new players showed up in the field, like the gut, but also the lung. Why the lung? Environmental risk factors include lung infections and smoking and COPD, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Research has showed that a massive infiltration of myelin reactive T cells happen in the lung. The lung is a hub for autoreactive T cells on their way to the central nervous system, the CNS. Can the lung serve as an initiation site for CNS autoimmunity? Yes, it is possible and with a very low dose. So the lung is not just capable, but also very efficient in triggering autoimmunity. What is the link between lung microbiota and microglia? It can affect the microglia, which are cells very important for MS processes. When they become reactive, this is causing a higher disease activity. The lung microbiota may influence susceptibility to relapse and may also play a role in the chronic phase of autoimmunity. I did an interview with Professor Dr. Alexander Flügel for the German podcast, which has a corresponding blog article you might find interesting and want to read using a translation option like Google Translate. It is number 202 and would translate to basic research and T-cells to better treat NMS. Interview with Professor Dr. Alexander Flügel. I hope the summary of day two of the Actrums provided you with some valuable information. A take-home message would be to discuss your therapy choices with an MS specialist that is up-to-date on the newest research data to best treat your individual pathway with the disease and to use the possibilities to lower severity of the disease by a healthy lifestyle from exercise to diet all the way to lung-friendly life. By the way, next time it will be a summary of Day 3 of the Actrums 2023 and I will talk about pediatric MS, female health, prodromic MS and HSCT in MS. So tune in again and hear you next time. Thank you for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You may also be interested in the previously published episodes and posts, which you can find at ms-perspective.com slash podcast. Perspective with a K. You can also get a free PDF with 11 tips for your positive impact on MS at ms-perspective.com slash newsletter. If you'd like to get in touch, you can reach me at nele at ms-perspective.com or on social media. Hear you next time.